Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Women and Shakespeare. I'm your host, Dr. Varsha Bantwani. I have been drawn to the work of our podcast guest, Professor Alexa Alice Jugo. Now, I want to ask you about your special issue of borrowers and lenders. And this is such a significant issue on contemporary transgender performances of Shakespeare. In the introduction to this issue, you propose trans as metal rather than as an immutable identity category that stands in opposition to more established ones, such as cisgender men or cisgender women. When I read your introduction, it really offered me a new way of seeing. So could you describe this methodology for our listeners, please? So when we think of gender, most people typically think of check boxes and some registration forms, or perhaps it is an ID that you hold that will provide an identification. Even trans is one of those categories. But that is not enough, even if trans is part of the drop-down list. My trans as method looks at gender from a fresh perspective. Um, in fact, gender is simply a set of social practices. It has to do with your mannerism, grooming habits, your choice of attire for a particular occasion. In the morning and in the evening, it is different. Today is different from yesterday. This week is different from last week. Now, it may be very subtle, right? Yet, there is difference. Crucially, crucially, gender as social practices evolve over time. Um, we probably no longer engage in the same practices as when we were teens, right? And it also evolved in the presence of other people. So it's actually a set of interpersonal relationships. Gender is personal. Every person is entitled to, to define their own path and who they are, and yet, it is also contextual, it's in, in the realm of the collective, beyond your own home. Hence, so much is struck, right? And if we look at it this way, we will be able to emancipate interpretations of a, a lot of characters. In one of my talks recently, I alluded to whether there are transgender characters in Shakespeare. Experts may answer, Yes, um, amateur readers may scratch the head and wonder, really, were there transgender characters in Shakespeare? I heard of a lot of cross-dressing. My answer is, historically, there are so many transgender characters that we have managed to overlook due to what I call cisgender sexist bias. A cis bias manifests itself most visibly when people use the term cross-dressing you know, cross-dressing is actually somewhat problematic because, because it already presupposes stable binaries. This kind of bias assumes all the characters are cisgender, and it kind of it, it makes certain kind of practices invisible. This is reflected in the play text. In the beginning of today's conversation, I alluded to, to Cesario. And Viola, if you pick up a copy of Twelfth Night, right? And throughout this story, the main character is who? It's the Thario. And yet, if you look at the character name preceding all the speeches, it keeps saying Viola, Viola, and Viola. There's no Viola, there's Cesario. And to me, all the Violas are a violation of Cesario. And so with, with, Trans methods, you have actually reopened Twelfth Night for a new reading, right? Cesario seeks employment at the court, and, and the identity of Cesario makes his life worth living. After the scene on the beach, Viola disappears. Cesario, as a trans man, takes over, and his displacement is partially defined by his uneasy relationship with Olivia, who falls in love with him, and with Duke Orsino with whom he's secretly in love. Cesaro's personhood is affirmed and undermined by all of these characters at different points in time. So 
Traditional criticism tripped up by the problematic misconception of cross-dressing as convenient dramatic device has overlooked all these trends cue. So what we need to do is suspend our cisgender sexism rather than engaging in suspension of disbelief when it comes to a story, right? We, we often think of cross-dressing as some kind of abbreviated act of make-believe. And that's just one of many, many examples of this kind of misreading. And the contemporary biases have been imposed on early modern texts to, to overwrite the fluidity at the time. People asked me, they talk about trends as method. Would it be a historical to apply these modern methodologies? In fact, it is a historical if we insist on modern biases and fail to account for different modes of being and thinking in historical times. Granted, back then, they did not use trends in this way. And yet, that does not mean that trans life was not valid at the time, right? The differences in vocabulary is exactly the reason why we need to use a more open-ended method to look at all of these historical practices and text, and in performative terms today, when we perform Viola and Cesario and Twelfth Night, perhaps we should take a more open-ended approach because these gender biases have diminishing returns as characters in Twelfth Night, they do not in fact return to, to where so-called where they came from. There's no return to normalcy. And this is pretty amazing. And this is not just about providing new interpretations or trying to revive a certain dramatic work, but I frequently think of drama as a humanities lab. In this exercise, we unlearn our habits and we learn new ways to look at the world. And so in the end, it benefits not just the production company, but actually the life that we will live outside the classroom and outside theater. So important to bear in mind as well, because I've seen so many productions of Twelfth Night, but I'm pretty irritated by the fact that as soon as the ending is arriving, they rush off when Cesario comes back in the same dress that they were wearing. And that really annoys me because even in the text, Nowhere is it mentioned that this actor will run off and come back in a dress. In fact, Duke Orsino keeps calling him master mistress. Then he keeps calling him boy. So there are so many rich possibilities there, which are, you know, closed down if we continue to think, as you said, with a sexist cisgender mindset. I fully agree, Varsha. Cesario does not dress up frivolously for deception, and double weddings are announced in the text but never staged. Most people forget that. And Cesario's personal truth is revealed by his choice of words and his action of not changing into, quote, maid's garment. It's mentioned that the captain will fetch them, but in fact, Shakespeare's text is open-ended. So in a way, for purists, this is a return to what Shakespeare wrote. I have to mention in my research, these gender identities are not fixed either. I continue to use this and trends for now because these terms are being circulated and there's work to be done, even though I believe one day we should transcend these terms, but that's in the future. Yes, absolutely. And I am so happy that you drew our attention to gender as dynamic practice. We change every day. And if gender is a practice, then that changes pretty much from moment to moment too. So that's great. Um, in this article, you also say that Shakespeare holds a central place in facilitating transgender performance. So you've told us a little bit about this, but could you elaborate what is it about Shakespeare that lends itself with trans studies and performance? 
And more importantly, why should trans studies and performance care about Shakespeare at all? Excellent question. The fluidity and open-ended language in Shakespeare lends itself to trans methods. And trans and queer studies should care about Shakespeare because this is one of the most visible canons that is circulating in our culture in various forms, even if fragmented. So like it or not, in order to deconstruct historical cisgender sexist biases, one of the best places to start with is with a group of highly visible and frequently quoted texts. So for these two reasons, I think the two should be brought together. That would Alexa. Alice Shugo. Dear listeners, adieu, adieu, adieu. But remember to tune in to Women and Shakespeare, streaming at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and numerous other platforms. If you want to listen to the podcast with a full transcript, head over to our website, www.womenandshakespeare.com. Until then, keep smashing the patriarchy.